let's talk about the moments of inertia, particularly of a slender rod. So on the left, we have a slender rod with the length L and the mass M. And this rod is being rotated about this axis of rotation here, which goes through one end of the rod. And on the other side, we have a slender rod with the same mass and the same length. The only difference is the axis of rotation is not through one end of the slender rod, but it's right down the middle of the slender rod. In which of these two situations will the moment of inertia of the slender rod be greater? The one on the left or the one on the right? What would you say? The moment of inertia, it depends on mass, but not only on the quantity of matter that's present, but it also depends on how that mass is distributed. The moment of inertia is usually some constant times the mass of the object times r squared, where r is the distance from, let's say, of a point from the axis of rotation. So what this tells us is that a moment of inertia is not just dependent on the mass of the object, but it's also dependent on how that mass is distributed in the object. The further away the mass is from the axis of rotation, the greater the moment of inertia will be. If we look at the slender rod on the right, there's no mass that's beyond L over 2, or half the length of the slender rod. But if we look at the rod on the left, about half the mass is beyond the L over 2 position. So we have more mass that's further away from the axis of rotation. Therefore, the moment of inertia of the slender rod in this situation on the left is going to be greater than that on the right because we have more mass that's further away from the axis of rotation. And you can see that in the formula. The inertia for a slender rod when the axis of rotation passes through one end of the rod is 1 over 3 ml squared. On the right, when the axis of rotation passes through the center of the slender rod, the inertia is 1 over 12 ml squared. 1 over 3 is much larger than 1 over 12. And you could convert this to a decimal to confirm that. So therefore, the inertia for this situation on the left will be much larger than the inertia for the situation on the right. Because more of the mass in this situation is further away from the axis of rotation, even though the total mass is still the same. But the way the mass is distributed relative to the axis of rotation is different in this situation. So because we have more mass distributed away or further away from the axis of rotation, this slender rod has a larger moment of inertia. So make sure you understand that concept when dealing with inertia. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how we can derive these two equations. Now, let's say we have a slender rod and the axis of rotation is not in the center or at one end, but let's say it's somewhere over here. Let's say it's at a distance h units from one end. Now the total length of the slender rod, we're going to call it L, which means this part is L minus H. Because if you add H and L minus H, H and negative H will cancel, giving you L. 
Now, the mass of the rod is going to be m. We're going to take this small segment, which will have a length dx. And that segment is located x units away from the axis of rotation. And the mass of that segment, we'll call it dm. Now, in order to get the inertia, we need to integrate it. So the inertia is going to be the integral of r squared dm. If you integrate dm, you're going to get m. So mr squared is going to be some variant of that equation. So inertia is usually going to be in this form. We just got to find out what that c value is, the constant in front of the mr squared term. Now, in this problem, r is going to equal x because r is the distance between the axis of rotation and the point of interest. So since we're focused on this small little segment, r is the distance between that segment and the axis of rotation, which is x. So we can address our equation like this. We can replace r with x, giving us the integral of x squared dm. Now, we need to get dm in terms of x. And to do this, we can make a proportion. Now, assuming that, the slen assuming that the slender rod has a uniform density, we could say that the ratio of dm to m, that is the mass of this small segment relative to the total mass, that's going to equal dx over l. That is the length of this small segment divided by the length of the entire slender rod. The ratio of those two things should be the same as long as the slender rod has the same density throughout itself. Now, what we need to do is we need to solve for dm in this equation. So I'm going to multiply both sides by m. So we get that dm is mass over the length times dx. So now let's go ahead and replace dm with that result. So we have m over l times dx. Now, because this is a constant, it's not going to change. I'm going to move it to the front of the integral. So we have the inertia is m over l and the integral of x squared dx. Now, the antiderivative of x squared using the power rule, when using the power rule, if you're integrating x to the n, it becomes x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. So adding 1 to this number, 2 plus 1 is 3. And then we're going to divide by that number. Now, there's something I need to add. Because instead of this being an indefinite integral, this needs to be a definite integral. So we need to integrate this from a to b. Now, let's call this point c, where the axis of rotation is. That's going to be our center. So at point C, x is going to have a value of 0. Keep in mind, we're integrating this with respect to x. Now, at point A, if we go from x equals 0 to get to point A, we need to travel h units to the left. So we need to end at negative h. So x is negative h at point A. And point B, it's going to be l minus h. So we need to integrate this from negative h to l minus h. So that should be here for all of these. I forgot to put it there, but let's correct that. 
So we're going to evaluate this from negative h to l minus h. So first I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to move the 3 over here. So we have the inertia is m over 3l. And then we're, we have x cubed evaluated from negative h to l minus h. So let's plug in l minus h into this expression. We get l minus h cubed, and then minus, once we plug in negative h, it's just negative h cubed. So at this point, let's erase some of this, just to make some space. Now let's FOIL this expression. So this is L minus H times L minus H times L minus H. We have three of them. So L times L, that's going to be L squared. L times negative H is negative LH. This is another negative LH. So that makes negative 2LH. And then negative H times negative H is positive H squared. And then we'll multiply by the other L minus H on the outside. So L squared times L, that becomes L cubed. And then times negative H, that becomes negative L squared H. And then here we have negative 2LH times L becomes negative 2L squared H. I'm taking this one step at a time so I don't make any mistakes. And then negative 2LH times negative H, that's positive 2L, but H squared this time, since we have two H's. And then H squared times L, that's just LH squared. And then h squared times negative h is negative h cubed. So now let's combine like terms. We can combine these two and those two things. So far we have l cubed. So this is like a 1 here, and this is a 2. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. So we have negative 3 l squared h, and here this is 2 plus 1, so plus 3 l h squared, and then we have negative h cubed. Now this, negative h to the third power, negative h times negative h times negative h, that's negative h cubed. And then we have another negative sign here, so that's going to be positive h cubed. So negative h cubed and positive h cubed, they add up to 0. So we can cancel them. Now, what I'm going to do now is cancel an L. So we have an L on the bottom. So I can divide each of these three terms by L. So L cubed divided by L becomes L squared. L squared divided by L simply becomes L. So we have negative 3 LH. This L divided by that L, they just cancel each other out, leaving us with positive 3 H squared. Now that's the equation we want to save. So for any slender rod in which we want to calculate the inertia where this axis of rotation can move anywhere throughout the rod, this is the general formula that we want to use to get the inertia formula. So let's go back to the situation where we had the slender rod where the axis of rotation was at one end. So at this point, 
h is 0. Because the way we got this equation, h was basically how far the axis of rotation was from one end of the slender rod. So I'm just going to draw that situation again. So when we derived this formula, the axis of rotation was here. And h was the distance between the axis of rotation and one end of the slender rod. So if we put the axis of rotation at this position, h is 0. Now, when h is 0, what happens to this formula? So let's plug in 0 for h. We have m over 3 l squared minus 3 l times 0 plus 3 times 0 squared. So this part disappears because that's going to be 0. And we just get m over 3 times l squared, which means the inertia for this situation is 1 over 3 m l squared. So that's how we can get that formula. We just got to take this equation and replace h with 0. Now, what about if the axis of rotation is on the other end? In this case, h would be l. What formula will we get when h is equal to l? So replacing h with l, we get this. So we have m over 3 times l squared. This becomes negative 3l squared, and then plus 3l squared. These two cancel, and we're left with m over 3 l squared, which gives us the same formula. It's 1 over 3 ml squared. Now, let's look at the, the last scenario. Where the axis of rotation is at the center. So it's at h is equal to l over 2. So this becomes m over 3 times l squared minus 3l and then l over 2 plus 3 times L over 2 squared. So what I'm going to try to do is get common denominators here. So L squared, I'm going to multiply by 4 over 4. So it becomes 4 over 4 L squared. Now this is going to be 3 over 2 L squared. I'm going to multiply 3 over 2 by 2 over 2. So it becomes negative 6 over 4 L squared. So when you multiply 3 over 2 by 2 over 2, you get 6 over 4. Now this one, it's already going to have the appropriate denominator. So this is going to be L squared. 2 squared is 4, so that's L squared over 4 times 3 which is 3 over 4 L squared. So now that we have the same denominator, we can add the numerators of the fractions. So we have 4 minus 6, which is negative 2, plus 3, that's 1. So we have m over 3 times 1L squared over 4. But we don't need to write the 1. And 3 times 4 is 12. So we get m l squared over 12. In other words, we get this formula. Inertia is 1 over 12 times ml squared.